Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and let's talk about the ending of Sandman. So even whether you've read the comic or not, you have to admit, this is a pretty perfect show. Me, I am a massive fan of the comic, and I was thrilled with how well adapted every single episode is. Finally getting to see all these events play out in live action made me giddy. I haven't felt that way since the first Spider-Man movie. You meet again, Spider-Man! In fact, the only thing I did not like in the series was that scene where Patton Oswalt, who's great as Matthew, has to give Dream a pep talk to win the oldest game. Hey boss, listen to me. You know what can survive the anti-life? You. Other than that, no notes. Show's perfect. But if you haven't read the comics, or maybe if it's been a while since you've read them, you might have a few questions about this ending. What is a dream vortex? What did Desire do to Dream? Why did they do it? How did Lida make a ghost baby with her dead husband? And why does that baby belong to Dream? I mean, what the hell is going on? So I'm going to avoid spoilers from the comics because you really should read the original Sandman comics by Neil Gaiman and Sam Keith and a slew of other talented artists. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the events of the series just in case you missed something or maybe if you're watching this video a little later and you've forgotten what happened. This recap isn't going to take very long and then I'm going to dive into that ending. So the Sandman comic book takes place in the actual DC Comics superhero universe. So characters like the Martian Manhunter and Swamp Thing do cross over with this story. But the TV series was smart to distance itself from the superhero hero universes. We even see that at one point that DC Comics heroes are products in this universe just like they are in ours. For instance, in the comics, the person controlling people in the diner is Dr. Destiny, a Justice League villain. But they reimagined him perfectly in this series in a way that ties him to Morpheus's original captors. So what is Dream anyways? So Dream is one of seven beings called the Endless. These are beings that kind of embody the different aspects of humanity or really of all intelligent life. They are Destiny, Death, Dream, Desire, Despair, and Delirium. But you said there were seven. Yes, but one of them took off a few hundred years earlier, and I don't want to say who that one is because I don't want to spoil anything about the comic. All right, so each of these seven have their own realms that they maintain. In the case of Dream, he is the Lord of Stories, and his realm is a place where people's spirits actually go when they are asleep. Oh boy, sleep! That's where I'm a Viking! So, if you're somewhere else in a dream, what you're actually doing is visiting his metaphysical realm. Every dream or nightmare that you've ever encountered is a being that was created by the Dream Lord. So in the show, one of these nightmares, the Corinthian, leaves the dreaming realm so he can murder humanity at will. He likes the freedom, and he feels empowered by preying on human beings. So, before Dream can erase the Corinthian, a group of rich old men in England accidentally imprison him for decades. This causes the dreaming to fall apart. In the waking world, World, people begin to fall asleep for decades. The sleepy sickness affected nearly one million men, women, and children. Now, all of this is perhaps a commentary on humanity in the 20th century and how our reliance on technology inhibited our ability to see the world through a more fantastical lens. So Dream breaks out of his prison, but he is weakened. He spends the season gathering his tools where he placed portions of his power. So during this time, he journeys into hell to win back his helm, embarrassing Lucifer in the process. You embarrassed me. Lucifer is played brilliantly by Gwendolyn Christie. I mean, you look at her and you really do see this beautiful, perfect warrior from heaven who's fallen from grace. She has a plan to get back at Dream and at Heaven that is so perfect and devious and I can't wait to see it play out in season two, but more on that in a bit. What are you going to do? Bring Morpheus to his knees. Also, most importantly, Dream is an asshole. Thousands of years ago, he fell in love with an African princess and when she rejected him, he cursed her to hell just because she hurt his feelings. You embarrassed me in front of her. After Dream reacquires his tools, we enter the final arc of the season where things start to get really confusing. First, let's talk about the Corinthian. He was created by Morpheus to be a nightmare, but nightmares serve a function to help humanity. They expose us to our worst fears, so we're able to face them. You were my masterpiece. A dark mirror made to reflect everything humanity will not confront. I brought you into this world to serve humanity, not to feed upon it. The problem is, the Corinthian stopped living to serve humanity and wanted to live only to serve himself. He breaks away from the dream realm to eat the eyeballs out of random people's heads. Now, he does this for a few reasons. They are the window to the soul. And the Corinthian has no soul. But more importantly, eyes are also a way to create empathy. To understand someone, we look into their eyes. But instead of eyes, the Corinthian only has teeth. So instead of seeing others and relating to people with eye contact, he only desires to consume others and consume the means with which they express empathy, their eyes. He's unable to connect with any human being on an emotional level. He just wants to consume them. Do you know why I do it? So I can taste what it's like 
to be human. So the Corinthian is also a metaphor for how in today's society we don't feel empathy for one another and we're all just rampaging consumers. So the Corinthian's goal is to stay alive. He wants to keep Dream in prison so he would be free to walk the earth. And for the entire 20th century, he quietly killed thousands of people. He is a legend in his own lifetime, an inspiration to us all. Inspiring an army of serial killers who call themselves collectors. Won't take just anybody, I specialize. So these are people that the Corinthian has infected with his evil. None of these people can feel empathy for their fellow human beings. They just want to use and consume other people to make themselves feel complete. Hence the name, Collectors. Now, I'm something of a collector myself. Check out this issue of Justice League of America number 21. And by our nature, we collectors always feel incomplete because there is always another thing to collect, another comic book to add to our collection. And this is very similar to how the Corinthian and his followers will always be trying to kill more and more people. They can never feel complete. They will always desire to have more. They are symbolic of the seemingly endless stream of serial killers in the late 20th century a century where Neil Gaiman seems to think all of humanity went a little mad. So, then Rose enters the story. She is a dream vortex. Yeah, what is that? Is that like a big tornado filled with stuff you want to do? Kind of. Once every thousand years or so, a dream vortex occurs. So dream vortexes are focused around a mortal being. In this case, it's Rose. Think of a dream vortex like a natural disaster in the dreaming. Just like a wildfire will consume a plane of grass so the ashes fertilize more plants to grow. But the vortexes, left unchecked, will completely shatter the dreaming. When a vortex brings down the walls between dreams, she creates a single volatile dream that will collapse in upon itself and take the waking world with it. Whoa, Doc, this is heavy. Damn right. Ordinarily, Lord Morpheus would have stopped this vortex right away by killing the person that it was centered around. But in this show, he's trying to chase down stray dreams. And these dreams are all drawn in by the vortex. For instance, there's Galt, a nightmare who's attached herself to Rose's brother Jed, hiding out in his dreams. But she wants to stop being a nightmare, so she's actually giving him a superhero fantasy that gives his life hope. Even a nightmare can dream, my lord. And this is another brilliant adaptation from the comics, where it's an actual superhero who's stuck in Jed's dream, along with Lyda, who also used to be a superhero. Now, this dream vortex is causing the dreaming to crack, allowing the other realms of the Seven to bleed through. This is why Lyda's dead husband, Hector, appears in her dreams. This isn't a dream version of him. This is his actual ghost, his actual spirit. So, when the two of them hook up in the dreaming, it's real. The opening monologue in the series establishes that the dreaming is just as real as the waking world. But there is another life which awaits you when you close your eyes. So, because this is the actual spirit of her dead husband, and because they're actually hooking up in a real place, the dreaming, she is able to become pregnant with this ghost child. This is why Dream says, the child was conceived in the dreaming. It is mine. What? Because anything created in the land of dreams is part of the dreaming, and hence is part of his domain. The baby becomes hugely important down the road, which again, I'm not going to spoil for you here. You should read the comics. So Rose starts to believe that she can control the vortex, and of course, she's being egged on by the Corinthian. This dream is yours now. The dreaming is yours now. The dreaming is yours. Is that what he told you? Yeah, why does the Corinthian want all of existence to end? Doesn't he exist inside existence? Well, I don't think he wants existence to end. He just wants Morpheus to be destroyed because that way the Corinthian would get to keep on surviving. So the vortex starts to bleed into other people's dreams. And the most important one to note here is Barbie's, where she hangs out with this big dog named Martin Tenbones. Right. Oh, I thought you'd have something to say about the big dog. I don't know. Okay, well, it's a big dog. I don't see you pointing out every big human you see. <laughs> All right, good point. So Barbie's dream is going to become very important in a future story. Basically, she's been having the same dream since she was a child, where she visits this fantasy realm with a variety of capricious characters. So while Rose is accidentally collapsing this barrier between dreams, she's also attracting the other stray dreams. Gilbert was an entire realm inside the dreaming called Fiddler's Green. Like the Corinthian, he wanted to be autonomous to experience humanity firsthand. It was a privilege being human, Lydia. But unlike the Corinthian, he is a pleasant dream who believes in the best parts of humanity. A human is at the center of the dreaming. Is it not to remind us that we exist because humans dream, not 
the other way around. It's telling that at the end, he's willingly sacrificing himself for the good of the dreaming. All right, so I mentioned that once in age, a dream vortex naturally occurs, but Rose was actually never meant to be this vortex. It was supposed to be her grandmother, Unity Kincaid, but Unity had fallen prey to that sleeping sickness, which resulted from Dream being imprisoned. Now, this means that the vortex actually passed down her genetic line to her granddaughter, Rose. But what you may have missed is that all of this was set up and manipulated by Dream's sibling, Desire. <laughs> Oh, how? Uh, it's a complicated story. I have time. And that's about it. Oh, I understand, but maybe you should repeat that for the people who missed out on what you were saying. As you wish. So, Desire and their sibling Despair are always at odds with their three older siblings, Destiny, Death, and Dream. It's time that he learned that dreams are merely echoes of desire and despair. You see, Desire's power is based on people being unfulfilled. You don't desire something if you already have it. So Desire always wants to torment humanity by making them want more. This is the opposite goal of Lord Morpheus. When the waking world leaves you wanting, a sleep brings you here. The dreaming doesn't show humanity what they want. It shows them how to get what they want. The dreaming is a land of possibility. And as long as dreams are making people feel fulfilled, then desire's power wanes. This is very similar to Lucifer, whose power is derived from people in hell desiring an escape to heaven. What power would hell have if those here imprisoned were not able to dream of heaven? Maybe Desire even wanted to expand their realm into the Dreaming to gather more power. See, we're made to think that the Corinthian is the big bad of the season, like he's pulling everyone's strings to distract Dream, but the real antagonist was Desire all along. What? I think it's likely that Desire influenced the Corinthian to begin with. They gave the Corinthian the desire to leave the Dreaming, the hunger to feed on humanity. Desire probably influenced Roderick Burgess to try to imprison Death to begin with, feeding him with the desire to once again see his son alive. With the spells recorded in in this book, we can compel death to return our sons to us. So when Dream was hunting the Corinthian in the waking world, this left him vulnerable to imprisonment and his imprisonment caused the sleeping sickness. And this sleeping sickness allowed Desire, whose sex is fluid by the way, to rape Unity Kincaid and impregnate her. But in my dreams, and I met a man with golden eyes, and we had a baby. Now this means that Unity's grandchild Rose is now a descendant of the Endless, and the Endless have a very strict rule. They are not allowed to spill the blood of another member of their family. What did you truly intend? That I should spill family blood? With all that would entail? I'm guessing this is because if they all went to war, it would end all of reality. So Desire cleverly found a way to make a member of the Endless into a Vortex leaving Dream no choice but to kill the Vortex and thus kill his great niece. This would mean that by their laws, Dream would be put to death and would be replaced by a new entity, maybe one less powerful who Desire could control. But luckily, Unity saved the day. I was meant to be the Vortex of this age. But Desire is not done manipulating Dream, and Dream also made an enemy of Lucifer. Our enemy, Dream of the Endless. The armies of Hell are yours to command, should you wish to strike. So that abyss with all the mouths is a very powerful demon named Azazel. It becomes a very important character in a future story, which again, I'm not gonna spoil here. So Lucifer hatches a plan to get revenge on Dream. And we're sort of made to think that this plan involves using her armies to invade heaven. But she's actually got something much worse in mind that will set up a chain of events that will reverberate all through Dream's existence. Something that will make God absolutely live. Which again, I cannot in good conscience ruin it for you, but it's awesome. So let me know what you thought of the first season of Sandman down in the comments below. Is there anything you loved about the adaptation? Something you thought they got wrong? Please let me know here, or you can at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.